it's a joy to be able to share with you on this very, very special and sacred occasion. Here at Ananda Village, it is uh, Saturday morning, and yesterday was the actual day, the 10th anniversary of Swamiji's passing. And as we have each year, we started the morning with a six hour meditation. Some of us were in the Moksha Mandir at Ananda Village, which is underneath the floor there, underneath the pavement, is where Swamiji's body rests. And others were in his apartment or in the dome where he gave so many, many satsangs and uh, lived for many years. Very, very sacred, as is everywhere that Swamiji went. You know, uh, Swamiji had a very special friend in India named uh, Sri Kartikeyanji. He's still alive. Um, a very, very fine man. And he's on the um, board of directors associated with many, many spiritual organizations, probably on the board of directors of 15 or 20 spiritual organizations, highly regarded. A uh, wonderful humanitarian who goes around the world just helping uh, uplift consciousness. At any rate, he said to us very soon after Swamiji's passing, the first um, we went to India uh, soon after Swamiji's passing 10 years ago. And when we met with Sri Kartikeyanji, he said at that time, you just wait and see, Swamiji's power is going to grow and grow. He said, I've seen it with other great saints that when they're confined <clears throat> in a body, there's only a certain amount that they can do. But once that body confinement is released, their energy is available to spread much more, not only widely, but powerfully. And so it is proven the last 10 years, we're going to talk about the legacy of Swamiji and, and what has happened um, since his passing 10 years ago. And certainly there's been this dual spread of breadth and depth and power. Um, Ananda, his work has increased around the world. Uh, 10 years ago, I don't have any idea of figures, but I would guess that there must be at least double the number of people associated with Ananda and drawing from Ananda as their spiritual sustenance um, as there were 10 years ago. And so that has spread, but that the numbers are not important. What's important is the spiritual power that has gone out to attract people to be associated. And it's that power of transformative consciousness that is the important legacy that Swamiji brought. Now, <clears throat> because Swami was dedicated, lifelong dedication to completely attuning his will to the will of master. And to, master, of course, was, we could say master is God in a carnate form who is here to guide, especially those who are, those who have chosen to align their will with master's will. Well, Swamiji was, as the term would be said, he was all in on aligning his will with master. He didn't hold anything back. And so above all, the legacy is that alignment and that discipleship. But I wanna talk about, to a certain extent, three layers of legacy from Swamiji. First, there's the tangible things. As we know, he wrote over 150 books and 450 pieces of music, gave hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of talks that are recorded. 
And so all of those are available, and they're much more widely available now than they were 10 years ago at the time of Swami's passing, partly because of the expansion of technology that is going to happen naturally during Dwapara Yuga. So the channels for that vibration to get out are growing and growing and growing and will continue to grow. But that tangible legacy, let's just take the music. Last night here, we had a beautiful evening celebrating uh, the, the 10th anniversary of, of Moksha Day. And we played the Sonata, Mukti played the Sonata. We had explanations of Swamiji's talking about that Sonata called the Divine Romance. But that's, along with that, there were probably another half a dozen songs that that we had during the evening program. But the music that Swamiji wrote, now that isn't just music, it isn't just tunes, it isn't just uh, nice melodies, it's all of that. But what it is, is it's the vibration of holiness and the vibration, the, the sonata is called the divine romance, the search of the soul for God. So Swamiji's music represents the soul's yearning for and search for God. And, and he's been able to take that intangible universal vibration and somehow musically, because he often said that he didn't write the music, he received the music. And so that vibration of music has come to him and he's put it out in tangible form. And that music is pl being played and sung by more and more people around the world. The same is true with the books that he wrote and the lectures that he gave. It's expanding and expanding and expanding. Well, those things that are tangible are easier to look at. And if we had the kind of patience and the mind to do so, we could probably count the number of hours uh, of YouTube videos that are viewed or lectures that are seen or how many hours of music are sung every week. Some, some I don't know, bookish scholar could probably sit and, and think of that kind of thing. But I, I say that only because the tangible things are relatively easy to see, but honestly, they're the least powerful of the legacy that Swamiji left. On a second level, is, as Master said, a scripture, or in this case, a teaching, has to be true on all levels, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. So the physical level, the music, the lectures, the books, um, all of that, the communities, the beautiful communities were in the process of seeing 19,000 tulips bloom right around Swamiji's house. Tens of thousands of people come every year to see that beauty. That again was an idea in Swami's mind of the creation of beauty, to allow people to come and feel that. And, and that too is a legacy. So as I say, that tangible aspect is relatively easy to see. But on the next level, the mental and emotional level, that's more important than the physical level. Because the physical level, those things, the books, the music, the communities, all of that are only meant as vehicles to be able to transmit the consciousness, to be able to channel the, um, the wonderful clarity of explanation uh, of scripture, of spiritual truths. I know I'm prejudiced in this, but I have never come across a teacher who could explain deep philosophy as clearly, as lucidly, and as powerfully as Swamiji could do that. So that the explanations, the, 
so he took scripture or he took um, spiritual thought that is the spirit is intangible he took that intangible spirit and through his writings he made it tangible he made it readable he made it understandable or hearable and so the next legacy that has continued from Swamiji is yes he did that but much more importantly he empowered hundreds of others to do it around the world we have ananda devotees ananda teachers ananda acharyas we have people spe speaking about these truths teaching courses in it um, kind of constantly channeling a huge flow of energy of this beautiful spiritual vibration and truth that our lineage came in order to release into the world. So, so yes, we have the tangible things, but the consciousness, the ability that Swamiji had to empower others, to train other leaders. You know, at the time that Swamiji created Ananda, there were many other communities that were created. Very, very few of those either survived or if they survived have expanded beyond the time of the leader because the leader of most of those had a vision expressed that vision but then told everybody how to do whatever he wanted them or she wanted them to do and didn't train leaders swami was exactly the opposite he he empowered and released the freedom of people to understand these truths and express them on their own. And so that has gone out. Even more important than the intellectual is the vibrational, one might say the emotional vibration that Swamiji put out and, and is a living legacy in the world of Ananda. Swami was kind. Ananda people are kind. Swami was joyful. Ananda people are joyful. Swami loved humor. Anywhere you go in the world of Ananda, you see people laughing and joking, and you think, well, of course, that's just the way it is. It's not the way that it is. There are many paths that are grim, many paths that just suppress any joy any expression of joy. Uh, Swamiji went to a community, um, I don't even want to say the path, but definitely not our path in Germany. And he came back after that visit and he said, everybody there is depressed. He said, they have the grimmest teaching I have ever seen in my life. They all go around. He said, it's like they all need psychiatrists to come and perk them up a little bit. But Ananda's the opposite. It's filled with joy, filled with humor. That's a legacy of Swami. That living legacy of Swami is more important because that's what's going to live on. People will see that, will feel that. It's like that's the genetic DNA of the consciousness of Ananda. And Swamiji, being the father of Ananda, has released that, that vibrancy, enthusiasm, and kindness, and caring about others, and supporting, and allowing freedom of expression, all those beautiful, beautiful things. And even that is not the most important legacy of Swami. The most important legacy is the spiritual legacy, the absolute dedication to finding God, to sharing God, to remaining absolutely true to and aligned to Master and to Divine Mother as expressed through this line. See, that universal, infinite power has to have channels that express it and live it. And the universal power is there, 
Master came. He, of course, was the embodiment of it, uh, the whole line of masters. But unless there are living representatives that that torch that they brought can light another torch and those torches light two more and pretty soon the whole world is lit up with light. And that's the power of Swamiji's attunement to master. It's he did not create the light, nor did master create the light. All we can ever do is channel that light. But because master did so powerfully, it was his destiny to do so. But it was not the destiny of all of the disciples. Many of the disciples were just there wanting their own light to increase. They didn't have the same kind of, I don't know, motivation to, to share that light with others. That was Swami's primary motivation, was to find God and to share God with others. And that spiritual vibration that was contained in the body and the personality of Swamiji 10 years ago, he was already, of course, sharing the light, but 10 years ago, the confines, the limitations of that light were removed. And that light now has spread all around the world and has touched the hearts and souls, especially of those who have dedicated their life to living and sharing the, the light, but it has touched the lives of countless, countless, hundreds of thousands of people around the world. And that spiritual power and magnetism is the real legacy of Swamiji. And so those of us who were lucky enough to know him and live with him were blessed but also all those who tune in because let's face it, none of us listening to this new master in the, in the body. Maybe there's one or two that uh, knew him as a little uh, tiny child, but none of us, but master's power is alive within us. And so Swami's power is alive not only in those who knew him, but is alive and will be increasingly alive in people all around the world. So we're at the 10th anniversary of that legacy, but imagine the spread of that light when we, probably not we, certainly not in this body, but are here for the 100th anniversary of that. It will be a power that has the ability to change the world. God bless you. Well, good, good evening, good morning, everyone. I want to <clears throat> greet our friends in Assisi, and we're, we'll be seeing you in a few months. We'll be coming there in mid-August, so we'll be with you then, and that will be a joyful time. And we just, as Arudra mentioned, we just had an international uh, community leaders retreat here at Ananda Village, and Arudra, Mahia, Ruby, Anand and Kirtani were all here. So we were just with them a little over a week ago. So it's amazing how things just keep unfolding in the Ananda world. And also our dear friends who are watching in India, we will be with you in mid-September. So we're looking forward to that too. So, and thank you everyone online joining us in whatever country you are. And those at Ananda Village, thank you for coming. Over the years, Swami was asked a number of times, what is Ananda's mission? And he would give different answers depending on who asked, the circumstance, the environment. But they all show a different aspect of what Ananda is and what his mission was. Once someone asked him, what's Ananda's mission? And he said, to have fun. And that he certainly did. 
And he, as Jyotish was saying, he imbued that spirit of fun in everything. And uh, reading P.G. Woodhouse stories, having pool parties where uh, some, they were quite uh, polo water polo games. And Swami was right there in the middle of them. And he was playing and he was laughing and taking people on camping trips and skiing trips. And he wanted to share that the spiritual path is a fun experience, childlike joy. And that's reflected in everything we do. And we should use that as a guideline. In the years that have passed, as Ananda has grown, in the years that have passed uh, since its founding and since Swami has left the body, it's that's I've watched the people coming and I'm so happy to see, particularly in the young people, that they have that spirit of fun, that they're, they act creatively and spontaneously. And uh, because when we trained us as leaders to give people the ability to express themselves however they felt, to make it fun, and we should use that as a guideline going forward. Are we having fun? Whatever we're doing, if we're washing dishes, if we're leading healing prayers, if we're working in the garden, if we're teaching classes, whatever it may be, are we having fun? Because if we're not, then we need to pull back and ask ourselves, why not? Because that's what, we, what needs to be imbued in everything we do. And moving forward, it's contagious. You can see it. We watch guests here at the Expanding Light. They'll come, and for the first day or two, they're a little bit subdued. They're not used to being open and expansive because the world shuts you down, doesn't it? You're, you're not safe. You're not free. But after a day or two, they get it, and people are laughing and relaxing and sharing fun with each other. On another occasion, Swami was asked, what's Ananda's mission? And he said, Ananda's mission is to balance the joy on the spiritual plane, balance joy into the world in the spiritual plane. And so that, how is joy different from fun? Fun is a more of an outward expression. Joy is an inward quality. And he also said in one of his early, he went around the country on these, we called them the joy tours. And he used a very important phrase. He said, there is a joy appropriate to every situation in life. And he said, that doesn't mean that if your dear friend dies, you're laughing and having a good time, but there's a joy appropriate to that situation because you can feel that in this particular instance of losing a friend, that friend's soul is free now. And if they've good, lived a good life, they, they can imbue, uh, they can draw on that good karma. So as the world, as we are now, I see that joy being expressed in so many areas of service, in uh, our education for life, how we're teaching children how to live in joy, that that's the most important thing. Diana will talk a little bit more about that, but we have a wonderful school here at Ananda Village that we're just through effort and dedication, we're keeping it going. But in India, that education with joy is, the, is just taking off. We recently saw little uh, video clips Aditya, who is visiting it at, from India uh, from, uh, as part of our community leaders retreat, he showed little clips of students in India, probably 10 years old, about that age range, who are in this wonderful prototype of an education for life school. And it was so amazing, these kids, they never met Swami, they don't even know about Ananda. But one little girl said, I never really had any friends and I always felt lonely. But then when I came to the Education for Life School, they call it EFL, then when I came to the EFL school, I have lots of friends. And another little boy said, I was always kind of sad and I worked really hard at school, but I, I just, I didn't know how to be happy. And he said, now with EFL, I'm a happy person. And, and then one other little boy said, 
I, I'm not dumb, but I couldn't concentrate. So I never did well in school. Now with the EFL school, he said, I can concentrate I through learning how to meditate. I can do much better at school. So you feel that, and that's one example of bringing joy into daily life, to balance the, the turbulence of the world. And Ananda's mission is to, uh, as Swami said, to bring, to balance the world on the spiritual plane. And so in every aspect of life, and as we said, there's, well, we have a, whatever the situation, we have a very beautiful work that's been started here at Ananda Village. We call it the Compassionate Care. And it's to help elderly people in the community, people who are have uh, medical emergencies. And you think, well, that's kind of sad, but it's not sad. And it's all, we have two or three staff, 20 volunteers, and they're on call all the time. Recently, a friend of ours, a dear friend who has been part of Ananda for many years, she's elderly and she was stricken with both COVID and pneumonia, and she was critically ill in the hospital. Gratefully, happily, she's on the road to recovery now, and looks like she'll move through this. But she was in the hospital and quite ill, couldn't breathe very well. They didn't know if she was gonna make it. And her son and members from Ananda were there 24 seven around the clock, helping her, being there for her. And one friend told me that he was with her uh, all night long and he just was, she was, would be sleeping. She was holding his hand and then she'd kind of wake up. She said, oh, you're still here. He said, yes, I'm still here. Then she'd kind of doze off and wake up. Oh, you're still here. That's joy in action. That's joy appropriate to that situation. And that's Swami's legacy. I remember when he was in the hospital having, he had just had hip surgery, one of three, because he had one, then the other, then the first one didn't, uh, had problems, they had to do it again. And Jatish and I were with him in the hospital. And after a while, he could get into a wheelchair, he couldn't walk yet. And he said, let's go up and down the halls. And so we went down the halls, and at the end of the hall, there was this very old man in a wheelchair and looking totally vacant. And they had him strapped into the wheelchair so he wouldn't fall over. And so Ami said, let's go over and say hi to that man. So we wheeled him over and he was just, you know, slumped over, eyes vacant. And Swami just with such joy and power just said, good morning. And it was like watching, if you know the American fable Rip Van Winkle, it was like watching Rip Van Winkle. He, he kind of sat up and his eyes opened and he looked at Swami and he said, good morning. But it was the most beautiful moment of sharing joy in whatever circumstance. And the world may be going through difficult times. It already is going through difficult times. And looking to the legacy, we need to share joy in all circumstances, whatever happens, war, depression, We've come through a pandemic, but maybe worse medical crises happen. But that was Swami's legacy, joy in all circumstances. And we need to be warriors of joy, carrying it on into the future. And then finally, Master said that he saw his Kriyabans. This is in the last chapter, of auto, last pages of Autobiography of a Yogi. I see my Kriyabans like sparks of light all over the globe. And Swami brought Kriya Yoga in an accessible, accessible, easy to understand, training to people, and not just Kriya, but meditation and all of our techniques. He made them easy for people to get, not in a weekend, you have to train, you have to get the training, but he did it in such a way that people understood it and they accepted it and they made it a part of their lives. And I asked our Kriya minister here at Ananda Village, how many people do you think 
she did a little math on it, have received Kriya from Ananda globally in the last 10 years since Swami passed. And she said, I telling it all up, I think 5,000 people. That's a lot of Kriya bombs. And how many people have had training in discipleship and meditation and different aspects of our path from Ananda online and in person? Tens of thousands, many, many tens of thousands. That's a big wave, a big wave of light. And in one of his talks, Swami said something and we, uh, we made a beautiful, we took a quote from his talk, we made a beautiful plaque of it, and it hangs in our outreach ministry, our Sangha office at Ananda Village. And he said, Ananda is like a great wave of joyful energy that wants to give and give as long as people are willing to receive. And that's what we are, a wave of joyful energy. Swami was the momentum behind the wave. Master was the ocean of joy. Swami moved that ocean in a great wave through Ananda and, and it continues to move. The world we're moving in, who knows where we're going. But you can't say, well, 10 years from now, this will happen or that will happen, good, bad, or indifferent. But what we can say is that if there is a joy appropriate to every situation, we will find a way to express that joy. We will find a way to reach people in new ways, to reach people where they are in whatever language they speak. This is happening incredibly in India. Diana will speak more about this in a moment. But the translations, our Spanish ministry, where people are receiving the teachings, we have uh, wonderful uh, heads of our Spanish ministry. Every major event that we do, everything, they translate into Spanish. So people around the Spanish-speaking world can get them. So this great wave of joyful energy. And I, I'll close with this thought. I remember the very first day, July 4th, 1969, that I set foot on Ananda. I had taken my last college final, done with that life, got a ride from the college student ride board, uh, cross country from Wisconsin, arrived, got a ride to Santa Cruz, then took a bus to Nevada City, and had a backpack and a sleeping bag, and I set foot on Ananda, and I was standing there. I didn't know what was next. I didn't have any idea, but then I felt, I felt this, wave, this movement like a great breeze behind me. I didn't know what it was. Never felt anything like that before. And then I turned and there was a man standing there. I didn't know him. He was wearing Bermuda shorts and a summer shirt. His hair was long, but it was tied back in a bun. And he walked up to me and he said, I'm Swami Kriyananda. But I felt from him this wave of energy. And then he kept going. And, and I thought something great is going to happen from this point that will spread everywhere. And Swami was a carrier wave for that great flow of energy and light. And all of us, all of us have felt that, in, whether we knew Swami or not in the body, we all feel that carrier wave of energy. And that's what motivates us to keep doing what we're doing with fun and joy and creativity and dedication and self-sacrifice and discipleship and everything that his life embodied. So more and better, more and better, as Gyanamata said. And it's just such a joy. I'll end with this thought yesterday as Jyotish said we had this six hour meditation and afterwards we gathered in a big circle outside of the moksha mandir and sent out blessings into the world but to see the joy in everyone's faces to see the light and dedication in the young people i just thought swami as master said lord god has given you a big family 
and Swami's family is growing and increasing because it's based on joy and inspiration and most of all, love. God bless you. Thank you, Jyotishin Devi, for sharing this, this joy and this inspiration and this divine love with all of us. And I would like to introduce the next two speakers. One is Nai Swami Dhyana, who together with Nai Swami Jyotish is the spiritual director of Ananda in India. Jaya, sorry, what did I say? Jyotish, sorry. Well, yeah, Jaya. Nai Swami Jaya. And but Dhyana, in some way, she was also part of the first group that actually came to Como, to Lake Como, which is in Italy, which is when Ananda first came to Europe. So, and she had been lived there for some years and served also, also here in Assisi as a spiritual director before Swami asked her to serve in other ways. So it's really a joy to have Diana share with us and also Narayani, I'll introduce her right away, um, who has been a crucial part of Swami's life in the last year of his life. And Swami had felt guided to have her become his um, personal assistant because of her deep selfless devotion, dedication and attunement. And she had a crucial role not only in, in the last years of Swami's life, but also in bringing the younger generation closer into Swami's aura. So it's going to be a joy to hear from both of them. Good morning, friends. And good morning to all of you online and namaste to Indian Guru Bhais. It's really a joy to share on this auspicious occasion. And I was remembering when I read Autobiography of a Yogi, I felt like everyone should be practicing these teachings. I immediately went into outreach, and, and but I didn't find anyone who was interested in that till I came to Ananda. When I came to Ananda, Swamiji was interested in outreach. He wanted to go out beyond the village, beyond the centers even, and help people and serve people and give master's teachings out to everyone. And so when I met Swamiji here, one, the first thing I, I remember someone was saying that they were in the car with him once and they were driving and Swamiji was taking a little nap in the car and people were saying, well, there are people from Nigeria who want the teachings and maybe we should send someone and people in the car said, we'll never go there. And Swamiji woke up, why not? <laughs> and then, so we, now we have Africans who are part of Ananda's work uh, through home study. And then I remember once uh, I was went to Australia, a couple of us went and and uh, we came back and Swamiji was saying, now, should we have a work in Australia and the people in Australia? And I had a long list of why we shouldn't have a work in Australia. And so Swamiji asked each of us to say what we thought. And I was first and I gave this long list and he just went next. <laughs> He just wasn't interested. He wanted to get out. And then when I went to India, I asked Swamiji, should I stay here? Should I go back to America? Uh, what is your advice? And he said, look around. You're desperately needed. And he's saying that to all of us. Look around. You're desperately needed. He has a great work to still do through all of us. And I, he wanted us to get in tune and take the work forward. And so I wondered often, how were we going to do this? He, he was the wave behind it, but we needed to catch up with him. And I remember in Italy, some of you may remember this, when I asked Swamiji, well, what do we do when you leave us here? There were four of us there and Swamiji went back and no one came for a long time. And you know, you've probably heard many of the stories. But uh, Swamiji said something I'll never forget. He said, Dhyana, tune in, pray to Master and Divine Mother, and you will know what to do. And that was what he told us for reaching out to people, tune in. 
and you will know what to do. And then uh, he told us often in India, it's not my work, it's not your work. This is Babaji and Master's work. They're guiding this work. He made it very clear. And then when Swamiji, just soon before he left his body, we asked him at a satsang, Swamiji, will, will you be as much with us after you leave your body as you are now? Can you still help us? He gave a very interesting answer. He said, I really hope so. Now, it took me a while to understand what he was saying. He was saying, of course, I'm going to be there. Will you be there? Will you be in tune with me so that I can guide you? And so when we went to India, Swamiji, he launched India, he planted the seeds, he had so many things going right at the beginning. We had a bookstore, he was on television uh, regularly on Indian television. He was writing books like Essence of the Bhagavad Gita. He was lecturing. Uh, we had a school going right from the beginning. And I remember the lectures were just packed with people. One in Chennai, there were 2,000 people in the hall, and there were 1,000 who couldn't get in. And Swamiji told Jaya and I, go call Dharmini and Dharmarajan because we need to get a center here right away. So we called them and we said, Swamiji said, you got to get over here. And they said, he already called us before the talk. <laughs> he already knew we were going to have a work. And they came and they're doing a wonderful work there. And then we continued what Swamiji started, but he planted the seeds. We're just watering those seeds. And we would go out to every major city, almost every month, a group of us would be on the airplanes and going to Bangalore, going to Chennai, going to uh, Mumbai, going to Pune, uh, Hyderabad, many different places, just spreading Master's message and what Jyotish and Devi are saying, his vibration and the joy and love. And in the very beginning, it was uh, hardly any young people ever came to the talks. We wonder what happened then. And they finally told us, our parents told us, don't come until you're old to yoga. <laughs> this isn't for you. But now they're all coming because they saw the joy. They saw the energy. They saw the magnetism. And so from there, we started going, we did level one, Hong Sa, Energetics, then we did level two with them, with this uh, Raja Yoga, and then we'd go back again, and all those places, we just kept going around, and all the way to Korea. Then what happened? Centers sprouted up. So we have centers in all of those areas. We started with one, and Swamiji kept saying, go out, get out there, go out there. And I want to read you the list of the places where we, where we are now um all throughout india <clears throat> we're in all the major cities and local indian devotees are the center leaders here are the places where we are gurgaon west delhi noida this is all up in the north delhi mumbai worley a brand new center in mumbai pune Ahmedabad, Chandigarh, Ludhiana, Hyderabad, Bangalore, Chennai, Kolkata, and many meditation groups, new meditation groups. Three just started this year alone. Then there's home study and these countries besides India, also a, a, medita a center in Singapore. And then in home study, South Africa, Japan, Malaysia, China, we have a strong online community. This is all mainly since the past 10 years. Teachers, we have 40 Acharyas, light bearers in India, 13 Kriyacharyas. We have over 150 trained yoga teachers and the same number of trained meditation teachers and deeper programs, sadhaka program, living discipleship program. This is what Swamiji wanted. He wanted us to give the teachings train people and let them be uh, in leadership positions there. And then the books, Swamiji's books are not just in English. Listen to these languages, uh, Indian languages, Hindi, and classes are being taught 
in other languages, in Hindi. Some of us are doing our best in Hindi. Hindi, Marathi, Punjabi, Kannada, Tamil, Gujarati, coming up this year, Malayalam, Bengali, Tegal, uh, Telugu. <laughs> I was pronouncing that wrong. It's amazing. And all people are being reached in their languages. I'll tell you a fun story that one of the people who's in charge of our uh, work in the Hindi Sangha said someone called him. He was at the village and someone called and said, this man wants the, lang wants the teachings in his language. And our person said, no, it's only in English. And so the guy called him who wanted the teachings and he said, no, I'm sorry, we can't help you. It's all in English. And the man said, well, now tell me this. Um, now, where's Babaji from? <laughs> and he said, no, what about Yoganandaji? What about Swami Sri? What about Lahiri Mahashaya? Where are they from? Where did Kriya Yoga come from? He says, well, I guess you're right. They're all from India. He says, we'll do it for you in Hindi. <laughs> so all the languages. And also now other areas that are expanding since Swamiji's passing, we have a monastery. We have five and a half acres. We have 10 great souls who are heading many of our departments who are monks. We have a work, uh, an education for life, as Davy was saying. We have 800 children, at least, who are being serviced through education for life within schools in the um, national capital region in the Delhi area. It's a joy to hear those children's testimonials, to hear the teachers' testimonials. You see the little children are singing Swamiji's songs. All the world is my friend. It's just so beautiful. And then you see the children lighting up. And also we have our work in Brindaban, which is uh, serving 3,000, more than 3,000 uh, widow mothers who have no one. And we not only give them food and clothing and everything, it's upliftment of consciousness. They do meditation, they do kirtans, they pray for other people, they make things and give them to people. And what a wonderful thing is the staff, 25 of the staff of the Brindaban group are going to be Kriyabans by the end of this year. So isn't that an amazing fact? that they're a part of master's teachings. And finally, we're serving in a, an orphanage in Mumbai, the, the, Mumbai's, the Mumbai Gurubais, and they're children who have no one here again. And to hear them singing, joy, 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 ever new joy, it's so touching those children. And I asked them, I said, are, are you happy here? Because our people go there every week and they give them joy. I said, are you happy here? They said, of course we're happy. <laughs> it's so sweet. It's so sweet. And so this is just spreading all over India and all over the world. I'm just speaking particularly about India and how will we go forward? Of course, we also have our Ananda Cafe it's packed all the time. And it's packed with Master, Ma, Swamiji's books, Master's Vibrations, Jyotishji's paintings. I think they sell more of the books and the paintings than probably anybody <laughs> because the people want to go there. Why? Joy. Joy and love. And I'll end with a beautiful story that um, we will go forward and how? with Swamiji's qualities of as we've been talking about kindness and love and Swamiji said to uh, Jayaji and I once he said it's not enough to give the teachings you have to give bliss give masters joy give that to people and then with that that's why people flock to us they flock to us in India I remember I was teaching a class once and I said now I'm going to teach you all how to sit, this was some years back, <laughs> how to sit in the proper meditation position. I looked down, they were all in the full lotus. <laughs> I said, I won't be teaching you. <laughs> but there's so much receptivity. And finally, there was a beautiful story of a man who came to Swamiji in the 50s to get Kriya. And he brought his son with him. 
And Swamiji approved the man and the little boy, he was 12, he said, well, what about me? And Swamiji said, no, wait, wait some time and then you can do it later. And the boy said, okay, so the father gets to Korea. Now, come all the way into 2005, I was at the lunch table and Swamiji was there and there were different guests there. And across this table was this man who looked at Swamiji and he said, um, do you remember who I am? And Swamiji looked and he paused, he didn't say anything. And he said, I was the little boy. I was 12 years old, I came to you for Kriya. And Swamiji said, oh yes, I remember you. And then the, the man now, he said, I waited all these years to take my diksha from you, take Kriya from you, to learn from you. Swamiji didn't miss, miss a beat. He said, I wait it too. <laughs> Isn't that the most beautiful story? So the vibration goes out. There's a lot of people out there, they're waiting. And they're gonna come back. They're gonna come to Master's teachings through Swamiji. And to close, I'd like to ask, Pia, would you stand up? Just quickly, because my time is up. Just come, come up, because Pia Singh is one of our trustees of Ananda India, and she started Ananda and Brenda Bond, and also she started the Education for Life, and she has several more amazing projects that are being developed right now. And we just want to thank Pia for all she's done. Thank you. Thank you. And to perceive um, your own attunement with what you feel Swamiji's legacy is all about. And for us also to meditate on it if we have not yet thought. We have been having such a wonderful weekend. I mean, if you can, those of you watching online, if you have an opportunity, please listen to the recordings of this morning because some of the talks were just heart opening. I mean, what they were sharing about Swamiji was so, so special. So I think Diana has shared pretty much everything that is happening in India. So I'm going to share a story that happened with me while coming from India. And I think this will pretty much do the trick today. We were waiting uh, at the airport. Swamiji and I, and probably you have heard already this story, or maybe you have read it already because it's written in my book. And at this time, Swamiji and I were coming from India to Europe. We were at the airport waiting at the gate, and we had an hour ahead of us, which was a wonderful time for Swamiji to be quiet, for me to read a little bit, to recenter, and to get ready to keep uh, moving on with Swamiji to whatever what's next. So while I was about to relax into that process, Swamiji nudged with his elbow, nudged me, and said, just look over there. And do you see that woman? She's crying. Could you please go there and find out what's happening? And I said, okay, Swamiji, I will go. I just put the bags next to him, went to that lady, and she was really crying. I mean, she was having like a almost a traumatic experience. I asked, you know, what's happening? And she said, you know, I lost my passport. I, I'm alone. This is the first time I'm traveling. I don't have my cell phone. I cannot contact anybody. I have already informed at the airport. The police is coming. And, and she, she was crying as she was sharing this story. And of course, I tried my best, like, you know, don't worry. You are in a safe place. I'm sure everything will be sorted out very soon. So after a few minutes of that exchange, I felt, you know, okay, it's fine. She will be all right. I went back to Swamiji and I say, you know, Swamiji, this is what's happening. It's perfectly fine. She's okay. She will be taken care of. Nothing to be worried about. Swamiji looked at that lady, looked at myself, and he said, I see you. And then he said, why don't you go back again and just make sure that she has a friend? She will probably be more comforted if someone else is by her side. And I thought, 
okay, I'll go back. So I went, I sat with her. I spent at least 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes talking with her, trying to, you know, distract her from her worries, a little bit of chit chat. At the same time, I was a little bit worried because I kept looking at Swamiji, you know, is he all right? What about if he needs to go to the bathroom? What about if he needs to drink water? He doesn't have anybody, you know? So my mind was in two places. However, I did as best as I could to uplift that lady a little bit. So after I thought was a fair amount of time spent <laughs> with that lady, I went back to Swamiji and I dared to tell him, Swamiji, she's all right. <laughs> just, just don't worry. I know she's all right. And Swamiji looked at me again, looked at the lady. And very quietly, he said, you know, we still have some more time left. Why don't you go back <laughs> and spend as much time as you can so we can make sure that she is all right. Just stay with her. By that time, I really realized this has nothing to do just with this woman, there is something for me to learn. And in that moment, those few seconds, somehow a greater awareness came into myself where I had to go back and open myself completely, wholeheartedly, without any resistance and give myself the best that I could of myself to that woman. So as I was walking towards her and I sat already with a completely different awareness of what the purpose of me being there was, suddenly I felt an incredible sense of joy in my heart. And the more I tuned into this, the more I give myself fully, more consciously, to that woman, the more the joy was increasing. And I realized, wow, this is the feeling that comes when we help other people, when we give ourselves completely to them. And not only that, this is the joy that Swamiji feels all the time when he is with all of us. Half an hour passed away and I didn't even care to come back to Swamiji. I was so engrossed in that experience that I realized this is it. This is what I was here for. I came back to Swamiji and, and I didn't have to share much with him. However, I say, Swamiji, thank you for sending me back to her. I, it was a wonderful time for me. Thank you. And he understood that I got it. So there are two aspects of this story that just very recently realized in a deeper way. One of them is that he had to send me three times to that situation because I wasn't spiritually magnetic enough to attract the experience that he wanted for me to have in the first place. It was only when I consciously gave myself fully to that experience so I could attract that transformational process within. And the second thing that I realized that Swamiji wasn't satisfied enough just to bring a smile in her face. Even though in that particular case, you know, would be appropriate, but it wasn't enough for him. 
what he was looking in that particular case was a transformation of her consciousness. And he kept trying over and over again until that happened. And then we were ready to leave. His service to that woman was done. So when you ask me right now, what do I think Swamiji's legacy is? I would say, people, you, us, this is the true legacy. Because let's face it, it takes time to actually help one another in a meaningful way while we are transforming ourselves in the process. But Swamiji has left to each one of us the greatest opportunity to get to do that, to learn how to do that with one another. And it's not about having superficial exchanges of energy. We are not here to fix each other's problems. What we are here for is to find a way to learn and to perfect how God can flow through us to others when we are with one another. And until we don't learn to do that, we will need to be sent back. Swamiji will send us back to that particular person to serve with that particular guru by, to send you back to that particular situation so we can learn how to give ourselves fully and open ourselves fully, fully without resistance to that situation, just so we can exchange that consciousness of the divine. So I deeply believe that Swamiji is going to use each one of us to keep his legacy alive and how we can learn to transform and to share that consciousness with other. That's our real job. And that's what he has, is expecting from some of us. And he will always send us to places to keep perfecting that relationship with one another. So see what are the areas of your life that you can still infuse them, that you can still transform a state of consciousness in somebody else while you are transforming yourself in the process. And this is what Swami Kriyananda's legacy was all about. He came here to change us while he was perfecting himself as well. So if we want to become a living legacy of his teachings, of his mission, we will need to find a way to do that as well with one another. Thank you, Diana and Narayani, for sharing Swami's presence and inspiration with us. And before I introduce the last two speakers, <laughs> yeah, that's okay. <laughs> we, we, we try to anyway get rid of the ego of, the, of our head anyway on the spiritual path, so that's okay. Um, before I introduce our last two speakers, I would actually like to just show everyone um, something. So maybe Krishna, when you can zoom in on this. So, so this is. Um, a piece of art, a light sculpture that Shantidev had, has created specifically for this celebration of Swami's 10th anniversary of Moksha. And 
we felt it was a special moment. So I had asked Shanti Devi, we had spoken about it before, and he tuned in to what would express what I think all of us feel, who Swami was and who Swami is. So, and anyway, I just wanted to show that and appreciate the inspiration that Shanti Dev tuned into through that. And our last two speakers for tonight and this morning are Naya Swami Skirtani and Anand, who Swamiji had asked to be the spiritual directors of Ananda Assisi and Ananda Europe. And, they've, and to share his vibration, to share Master's vibration, Master's light with all of us. And they've been doing that for decades now. And I think everyone who knows them not only appreciates, but is deeply inspired by the light that they shine and that they encourage in others. So, nice one, Ms. Kirtania. It's a, it's a joy for me to be able to speak in English. <laughs> as uh, many years as I've been here in Italy, and as much as I love the language and the people, it's still not like speaking your mother tongue. So this is, uh, it's, it's just easier. I wanted to comment on uh, Shanti Dave's image of of Swamiji, just to say I had seen, uh, we had shared uh, pictures of it on WhatsApp, and uh, they were very nice, but if you really want to get the full effect of what this uh, incredible creation is, you'll have to come here and visit. <laughs> <laughs> and we invite all of you to do just that, those of you who are here in Europe and in India and in America. I remember hearing from uh, a couple of our devotees here uh, some time ago that they were in India at one point and they uh, met someone who was with Master, so this was many years ago, um, and this man said, oh, you're with, uh, you know, Swami Kriyananda, I heard uh, Yogananda say, Master say, or he heard someone say that Master said, if Walter had come, most of you know that this, is, this was Swami's name, that Master uh, called him Walter, um, and he said, if Walter had come sooner, we would have filled the world. I don't know the exact word, but we, we would have spread the, this light all over the world. And so from, from Master, we get uh, the understanding of his having seen in Swamiji who Swamiji was and what Swamiji had as his essence. And so everything that you all have been sharing, and thank you so much for your uh, deep inspiration and enthusiasm for uh, Swami's and Master's work in this world. Um, it, it was almost innate in Swamiji that as soon as he had the, the, the channel for the truth that he had come into this life to receive, he had to share it. It was simply a, a part of his self and certainly of his dharma to be able to be a channel for the truth, to have found that channel in Master and to be able to share these teachings. So it's not surprising that what we are hearing here today is so much about what Swami's legacy is, yes, but how are we all going to be a part of what is, and, and we've, we've heard it said, and it's hard sometimes to really believe that something that you believe in could become so important for the world. But 
Master said it and Swami said it, that uh, Master said uh, this will spread like it'll start, uh, start as a zephyr and end up as a gale, that it will spread like wildfire. And I've shared here before my own doubts about that statement when I heard it in my earlier years at Ananda. I thought, how, how is it possible that an idea that is this little community that started out in the Ananda village in California, and how, how is it possible that this could become something that would spread around the world? And then computers came into existence, and then email, and then all of what we do online and what we all have done uh, during COVID. So much of what Master's truth is has been going out to many, many, many more people simply by being able to share in a, uh, in a way that is from this moment to the next out there to people. And so even if each one of us thinks, you know, I've been hearing that, you know, what are you going to do? You need to be committed. You, we all should understand that we are part of the, the zephyr that is growing into a big wind that is going to go around the world. Because it's like, um, you know, a snowflake, uh, we've, maybe you've heard this image, a snowflake in and of itself is nothing, you know, it's the lightest thing. And yet in a, in a snowstorm where the snow keeps falling and it keeps building and it, it becomes an incredible power and there can be snow avalanches that, are, that can be destructive, there can be snow piled up on branches of trees that break the tree limbs which no individual would be able to break. So if you think of yourself as a little snowflake, you think, I can't, I can't do much. But you are one of many. And as long as we realize that we, who we really are, and it'd be possible that Anand will be sharing a little more about that in talking about how we can really bring this truth, this light, this joy, this love of uh, the divine more perfectly into this world. Each one of us has a part to play. Um, I realized that our teachings talk a lot about energy. And I don't know how it was for you in the beginning with uh, energization exercises. I took the lessons from Self-Realization Fellowship and uh, I really enjoyed doing these exercises because I could feel energy that I hadn't experienced before. And in talking about what we can do and what we need to do in order to be a part of uh, seeing that Swamiji's work and Master's work gets carried forward is simply to understand our individual energy and how we can both raise the energy, the amount of energy that we have, and to realize that that raising of our energy also raises our consciousness. And so as we are practicing our teachings that Master has given us, we are doing our part to bring this uh, wave of higher consciousness and joy and light more and more into this world. So again, thinking maybe it isn't such a big deal for me to be doing my energization morning and evening, and maybe every once in a while when I'm facing a difficulty and I know I need more energy, but as we deepen our practice, as we deepen our understanding of the, the power and energy that we are through our meditation, through our wonderful Kriya and higher Kriyas, those of you who are 
not yet at that point, you have a wonderful road ahead of you of ways in which you will be able to become a more powerful magnet and a more powerful channel for all that we have been talking about during these days of honoring Swamiji. We are very, very blessed that we have master, that we have these gurus, that we have Swamiji, who in our lifetime has been a living example for us of what is possible if we continue to practice our techniques and to give energy to raising our energy. And you know, we will be happier. We've talked about, a little bit about the movie Finding Happiness, and um, I remember hearing from a few people um, who showed the, uh, the movie in their meditation groups uh, that people made some comments like, this is a movie, you know, we all know that movies are made up, you know, this, this isn't reality. People can't really be that happy. <laughs> and so it's important that we have our meditation groups, that we have our community and communities, and I want to talk a little bit about the ones that are happening here in Europe, um, because people can come and see for themselves. They can see the, what we see during and have seen and experienced during these days that we've had together. Um, the, the joy that is real, a happiness that isn't just superficial uh, smile and laughter, but something that, that shines in the eyes of people here and of all of those who really put these into practice. Um, and we've also talked a bit about, but I want to emphasize how important the training has been that Swamiji gave us, that, that Swamiji had from Master. You may have heard Swamiji say at times, Master didn't explain a lot in words, but the magnetism that he shared with us transformed us. And I just wanted to share that um, in our community, we have had some years of our younger generation um, knowingly with an understanding of what their role may be and what they want to be able to become. They have asked us, they have seen uh, from the teachers that all of you have come to know here, uh, how we have become channels because of our training with Swamiji. And that training was not uh, only through what Swamiji said and what he taught, but simply through sharing his magnetism. And others have talked about this and the importance of this really has come home to our generation of young people here. And a few of them came to us, how long ago was it? It's maybe, just, it was soon after Swami left the body because that was a, a wake up moment for them. They realized Swami's no longer here and our uh, our teachers, our leaders are not always going to be here. And we need to do everything we can to do the same thing Swamiji did with Master and we with him, to attune, to uh, absorb, to uh, become uh, through our own openness, really living channels for these teachings. And so they, they came to us and they said, we need, we need to do with you what you had with Swamiji. You know, you need to uh, invite us over for teas. You need to, you know, sit, sit with us and, and allow us to ask questions about what's happening in the community. Uh, how, would, how would Swamiji, uh, with you all, 
deal with these kinds of really practical situations. And those of you who are uh, with meditation groups, those of you who are starting community, this is a, a hugely important aspect of how we are going to carry forward uh, Swami's legacy. We need to be able to be on both sides of this uh, human relationship. If we have any experience, if we have absorbed anything from Swamiji in terms of consciousness, of energy, of magnetism, we need to be willing to share it. And if we are moving forward and taking more responsibility in our meditation groups, in our communities, in the work, we need to be open to asking and to seeking the training that can help us to be the kind of channel that each one of us is able to be. I don't know how often Swamiji said, you know, it's not even, an Ananda community, yes, it's very, uh, it's beautiful for the, the teaching that can be offered with different teachers, and, and that's a wonderful way for people to learn. But people learn even more by coming and being in situations, especially of service, uh, with those who already have absorbed these vibrations and this magnetism and the, this wisdom. And that it's really through being with people in, in an everyday situation that you come to understand what it means to live these teachings and what it means to be able to share these teachings. It's not just the, the intellect. It's so, so much more. And those of you who have been here, and we're so grateful that we now can do this for these days of honoring Swamiji's legacy and his life, have had an opportunity. Little moments of service, moments of seeing how people who have lived in this community maybe only um, a few months, and but some of us for 30 and 40 years, how we live the light that comes through the, the teachings, the light that comes through the music, the light that comes through all of the, the things that we've talked about being part of Swami's legacy. We are, um, we, we become living models as Swamiji has been for all of us. And we hope that every one of you, and this is something that we, that we hear a lot, people who come, and maybe they're here for the first time, and they, they, they absorb, they feel, they're inspired, they, they feel the joy you can see. We often talk about how if the choir sings for a group in an orientation, we, we connect with people and we can see people's faces. And many people who come here are tired, they need a, a retreat, they need, um, they need what Ananda has not because it's the only place that they can get it, but it is a place where people can come to be recharged. And so they go away and they go back home and, and for a while they are in that energy and people that are their family and their workers see this, but perhaps they can't hold on to it for very long. And so they come back and you all, many, many of you have come back many times. We all come back to a source of recharging, a source of energy, a source of joy, because we feel that as a result. And every one of you that is here can go back to where you live your daily life and be a recharging station. And we talk a lot about <laughs> recharging computers and now we recharge our cars. And you can become a recharging station for your families, for the people that you work with, 
within your groups. And this is an extremely important part of how we will and are carrying forward um, Master's work and Swamiji's legacy. We talked, we've talked a lot during these, day, the, these days that we're together and it's time to really take the inspiration that we feel inside, open our hearts. There have been so many opportunities in these days to open our hearts and to let Master in, let Swamiji in, so that we can have them right here next to us in every situation of our lives. In the worst situation, we can't have a better a, a companion than having Swamiji right here, or better yet, right here. Right in here, where we can contact. Some of you know that we, um, some of us were imprisoned. Those of you who don't know, uh, I can't tell the whole story. You'll have to ask someone at another time. It's a very interesting story. What was for me, very illuminating was that uh, we happened to be, and I can tell you, Shivani and Gitanjali and I were in prison together. And <laughs> we, we, actually, we actually got to stay together because they didn't have a cell, individual cells for us. So we were in the uh, infirmary and with, with several other women who were in prison. During the day, the TV was blaring, the, uh, there was smoking, there was, you know, all the conversation and, and activity. It was, a, it was a little bit of a chaotic scene. <laughs> At the end of the day, the TV went off, the other women went to sleep, and then we could meditate. And I would sit and meditate on our little prison bed. and. In the, when, when during the day, I had a lot of anxiety. I, I couldn't imagine how did I get to this place. <laughs> I couldn't, I, I could imagine because we all watch television and we read books about uh, prison situations. And so there was a lot of anxiety about, we've done nothing wrong. What, what is happening that they would have brought us into prison? And so you, you worry. You worry about what might have been said or done that wasn't true, but there it is. So that was the daytime situation. Although we did also sing for them and we had other opportunities to, to raise the energy. But at nighttime, when all of that stopped and we could sit and meditate, I sat to meditate and I, uh, doing the practices, I went inside and everything was fine. You know, there was no worry. Master had this in his hands. Our ability to contact that place of peace, real peace and understanding and uh, joy that doesn't depend on the outward circumstances, that is there and it was there. And so, you know, we'd had our uh, whatever hour, whatever, two hours of meditation, went to bed and then the next day started. We were only, what was it, four days, five nights, something like that. And it all resolved itself and there was, uh, obviously there was nothing that we had done wrong. But it was a perfect opportunity to put into practice the teachings that we know our masters and Swamiji have told us can really serve in very difficult, challenging times. And so if we are doing that day to day, uh, nourishing, recharging, keeping our energy high and bringing our consciousness here to be able to touch the divine within us, what would we fear? Today's world, there are many things that people can fear if they want to live in that fear. And 
That's why it's going to be so, so, so important that we carry on Swami's legacy, that we carry on Master's work, that we don't feel that we're not enough, good enough, or we don't have the possibility. We all have opportunities to be able to share the light, the happiness and joy, the love that opens our heart when we are attuned to a God-realized master. And Swamiji, as everyone has said, dedicated his life to this, to bring the possibility for each one of us to become what he became, which was a, a truly pure channel. Everyone who has spoken, and I uh, underscore Narayani is urging you to go and listen to the talks that people gave about how Swamiji uh, affected their lives. We all can become a channel, and we all can choose to be a channel more and more and more of everything that is positive in us and to let go more and more and more. That part of us that we know exists, you know, the doubter, the, the critic, the judger, the one who judges, we all have those aspects within us, but we can choose. I want to be a channel for the light. I want to be, as Davy said, a channel, warriors for joy, for love. And the more of us who do that, and if you gather together others in your, in your area who respond to that, then that is what is going to continue to carry on this legacy. So I challenge you, I encourage you, and I let you know that we are here to support Ananda Everywhere is here to support all of you who are um, really doing your inner work to become a channel to carry on Swami's legacy. So, Jyotish and Devi, Diana, nice to see you again after just so, only a brief week or so. Um, and thank you. I will echo everyone's sentiment. It's really been inspiring to hear everybody's uh, perspective, everybody's thoughts. We have been super blessed. Swami. It's going to sound odd that I say this, but uh, once in a while in your life, you just meet somebody that's very interesting. And Swami was that. He just was well-informed genius, really, in many ways. And um, so I want to read something. I'm going to take a, a tip from the Utes and use my technology. Um, so. Here is Swami's words, and I'm reading this because this is really how, this is an aspect of what we need to take out into the world in order to continue Master's and Swami's legacy. Swami said, the real conflict going on in the world today is not about politics or economic systems. It is, um, it is between those who live under the delusion that matter is the ultimate reality and those who understand that the underlying truth is consciousness. I don't know why for sure, but Swami, I, Swami talked with me often about this the reality of this world, we've heard Master, we've heard Swami say this is God's dream. And, but he, for some reason, continued to emphasize 
this aspect to me that everything is a manifestation of consciousness, that spirit is cosmic consciousness and that his dream is being, if you will, manifested onto the screen of space. So let me read you one other thing. And this is master, because what I'm getting at is that Swami helped me to realize that the essential part of the spiritual path is overcoming ego. But for many, many years, I thought, oh, that sense of I am something special, that's what ego is. So I'm going to read these words from Master. He says, soul and mind. This is a wonderful spiritual experience that Yogananda had. Soul and mind instantly lost their physical bondage. I'm going to just shorten it. My sense of identity was no longer narrowly confined to a body. We, as self-aware entities, are formless. We don't have a body, we don't even have a form. Master said he realized spirit was endless manifestations of bliss. So Swami called Master a bliss avatar. That that's what his message was, that he came to give this bliss, these teachings of bliss. And Swami took that and he has, everybody has spoken of the joy that Swami lived, that, that Swami wanted us to live in this joy and to give others this joy and this bliss. But it's much more than just simply understanding or having a narrow concept of what ego is. And this is where Swami was so great because he wanted to expand on that understanding that this sense of I is really formless. And we have to meditate in that way that it's not about a, a, an identification with form. It's about spiritual freedom and conscious expansion. And Swami taught it. And he, but he, he took us wherever we were at and he tried to help us understand what exactly ego transcendence is. In his beautiful song, Swami said, from sings or wrote, from living waters, um, this is a second, sipped in the silence, in spirit and in truth, break ego's spell. And we are under a spell of ego. And Swami <coughs> talked all the time, break ego's spell, the hypnotism of ego that we are this or that. Man, woman, we, and how do we break ego's spell? Swami's greatness is that, and Master's greatness, is that they realize it's no little thing to break ego spell. And that's why we have communities. Because environment is so important, and you can't do it on your own. It was very clear, Master and Swami saw, we need spiritual teachings, we need spiritual environments, and this needs to spread through the world because the real conflict is between those who believe that matter is everything and those who understand that consciousness is the underlying reality. If we understand that consciousness is the, understand, is the underlying reality, we then understand that our destiny, if you will, is to expand our consciousness. I am so grateful that Swami, in a way he drilled that to me or for me, he emphasized over and over this idea that ego is our biggest obstacle. And really, what are we talking about? 
It's just that we're in delusion if we don't understand that we are a formless, if you will, being of spirit. And then if we meditate from that perspective, then we begin to realize, okay, now I understand why he teaches us to meditate and to perceive the light. This is another great, some great words of Swami. Christ light has shone from earth to heaven. The spirit, the light of spirit has shone from earth to heaven, opened the doors of, I mean, yeah, he, Christ light has shown on earth from heaven, opened the, for us the inner door to all who love the gift is given joy and freedom evermore i mean there isn't even more beautiful words that describe what our path and what our destiny is open for those who love the gift is given joy and freedom evermore it's about the light of spirit it's about communion with god and what i saw in swami was that he understood he had to train his mind. He was a wonderful example of us, for us to train our minds. I watched him in physical pain and discomfort. He was very careful about where he allowed his mind to go. I watched him under attack. I. Uh, not physical attack, but attack for, from people who didn't agree with the work he was doing or didn't agree with how he was expressing Master's teachings. He was very, very careful where he allowed his mind to go. He was disciplined, he meditated, but he was happy. His discipline embraced joy and freedom, and it wasn't grim. I remember when I first heard a talk from Swami. He was so expressive. He had a long hair and um, he said, people talk about joy, but you can't, you can't be like this. When am I gonna find joy? <laughs> he just was so full in his message of that this is the end of sorrow. If we, in, if we enter into the spiritual path, and we embrace our practices, we, you, the joy we really feel is when we begin to realize, hey, I can train my mind, and I can control my thoughts in secret, in stillness, is where we need to find that place. Everybody laughs, my Rudra's gonna um, say, ah, he did it again. But <laughs> here is this wonderful phrase that Swami, I think it was in Rays of the One Light. The yogis teach that when the mind is deeply calm, the inner light spontaneously appears. I will probably chant that mantra and repeat that <laughs> for the rest of my life because <laughs> when the mind is deeply calm and don't think you can do it on your own. I hate to say it, very few have the karma to do it on their own. That's why Master, that's why Swami saw the reason why we need to create cities of light is to produce an environment that supports each other to finally enter in and accomplish that. It's practice, practice, practice in order to stop the spinning mind. And I read where Master said, and this is, I really think this is part of the problems with the world, is that Master said, if you don't learn to stop the spinning mind, it will take you into psychosis. I think the world's pretty much in psychosis. I think we're a little bit crazy. And, we, and look at those people in the world who are calm and centered. 
And that's what I saw on Swami. As he got older, I watched his posture change, but when I first met him, he was just like this. All this, this is how he walked, this is how he carried himself. Heart out, chest out, direct, any center. We need to be these channels of light, and Swami encouraged us to be channels of light. Swami trained us to be, but we can't be what the world needs if we don't ourselves learn how to calm the mind and enter into that Christ light, that light that, and in fact, again, Master said, when you perceive that light, then you know your eternal nature. That's how we become victorious over death. That's what, that's what Christ taught. Christ's light, he communed with that light. He taught us, he wanted us to commune with that light. Master, my, he's, he's a bliss avatar, and his, his reason for being even was just to share that bliss. So I don't want to go on. I just want to leave you simply with this, that we have been blessed. I honestly feel um, I walked beside a saint, and I walked beside a saint that was refined, that was disciplined, that was intelligent, that was joyful, that was friendly. He got off the train once in Zurich, and Kirtani and I went to meet him. And my heart melts when I ever I think of it, because he had been on vacation by himself, and he had taken a voyage, a cruise through the fjords up in Norway. When he got off the train, he wasn't real well. He didn't feel well. But he came up to us, and he said, I'm so happy to be with friends again. Just us two, I'm so happy to be with friends. And he was that to all of us. And Master was that to everyone. And we should be that to everyone. Friends, we're just friends with everyone. But the world needs us as friends, not to drive a teaching down their throat, but for each one of us to carry our torch, to carry our light, and just be ourselves in that light. And it starts with calming the mind and practicing these techniques of concentration, of having devotion and appreciation, not only to Master and Swami, but really devotion to God and the light of spirit. And if that's where our minds is, we all know that's how you accomplish what you want in life, is to put your mind on it. So we need to put our minds at, at silencing the mind and opening our hearts and our minds to the light of spirit. And that's a legacy that Swami will, Swami, Master, you could just almost feel their joy in the astral realm, in the causal realm, in omnipresence. Their joy is for us to do that, to spread the light and the joy of the Spirit of God. So thank you, Swami, and thank you all for being channels. And God bless you all. So I just wanted to say again, thank you, Kirtani Anand and Narayani and Diana and Jyotishin Devi. And before I, I ask Jyotishin Devi to close with a prayer for the world, I just wanted to also say thank you to all of our technicians, both on this side, um, Ruby, Durga, uh, Krishna Prem, and on the other side, Bhaktan and, and Jitendra, and probably others, and for making this possible this global satsang in sharing this Swami's joy and Swami's presence and Master's presence with all. So, thank you. So, I too want to uh, thank everybody for joining us. It's been a beautiful day, a beautiful weekend. 
And as speaker after speaker has said, that Swamiji unleashed a great wave of energy that wants to give and give, wants to love and love, wants to be friendly and kind. And that wave of energy is ours to ride or to be submerged under. I think we ought to choose to ride it. God bless you. We'll close with a prayer now. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Great Masters, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Tesvarji, Beloved Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, Beloved Swamiji, Beloved Swamiji, we humbly bow to you all. We humbly bow to you all. We come to you now, come to you now. with open hearts, with open hearts, with self-offering, with self-offering, with the deep desire, with the deep desire, to be channels for what you brought into this world, to be channels for what you brought into this world. May we become one with thee. May we become one with thee. Through our service. Through our service. Through our attunement. Through our attunement. And through our love. And through our love. Om. Om. Peace. Peace. Amen. Amen. Now let's chant Om and send out the rays of energy that Master and Swamiji have launched are launching, will continue to launch to uplift humanity. Jai Guru, Jai Swamiji.